And for those of you who are, are new to the YWCA, I just want to remind you of our mission, which is to eliminate racism and empower women. Uh, and Black Women Thrive is aligned with that completely. To tell you a little bit about our work, we do a lot of work to unleash the potential in young people and families from early childhood to teen girls. We build the economic equity that communities need to thrive through workforce development programs, uh, helping women start their own businesses, help people dream about the possibility of home ownership. And then finally, we help people heal and belong. And we have clinical therapists who support people from five to 85. We're experts and survivors of sexual assault, uh, but we're also very much interested in what we're talking about today, how we create belonging in, inside institutions, inside corporations, inside government so that Black women can thrive, so that all people can thrive inside institutions, which is why I'm so excited to be having this conversation. Again, we're inspired by the, the creative genius, the thought leadership, uh, the skills of Black women. Uh, they have ascended to various positions across different sectors. Uh, but we want to talk about some things that are, are, are gnawing at their leadership, uh, some things that are challenging their resilience, which is why I'm excited about the panel uh, that we have today. So without further ado, I want to introduce our powerhouse set of panelists uh, that are actually dialing in from other parts of the world. And first, I want to start out with my friend, Tracy Hall. Uh, she is joining us from London in Oxford. Uh, and most recently, Tracy was the executive director of the American Library Association. She is a book abolitionist. She is a scholar. She is a cultural curator. Uh, she is the recipient of the YWCA's uh, Racial Justice Award. She's Time 100's most influential leaders among many other accolades. We are so glad to claim you in Chicago and thank you for joining us from, and from London, Tracy. Uh, my, my second panelist is Dr. Venetia Bate Ambrose. And she is the executive director of the Lake County Community Foundation. And she is an expert in the social sector, DEI, community health and aging. And notably, she is a truth, racial healing and transformation practitioner. So we are delighted to have you on the panel. And we're gonna affectionately call you Dr. V uh, throughout this panel. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have Encore Kumar, who is a resident DEI expert with McKinsey Consulting. Uh, and she also leads McKinsey's Connected Leaders Academy, which supports Black, Latino, and Asian leaders. And she is a champion of some of the data that you're gonna see today, McKinsey's Annual Women in the Workplace Research. It's the largest study of the state of women in corporate America. So actually, Encore, you're gonna actually provide us some context for this conversation. You're gonna ground us in a little data from the report. And for our audience, we're gonna put the link to the report in the chat, because you do wanna read the full report, but Ankar, we're gonna pull up your slides so that you can begin to ground us a little bit in the conversation. And I say to the audience, we're going. this is gonna be a powerhouse conversation. We, it's not enough time for this subject. I'm just being really transparent. This is not enough time to do this subject justice. So this is just gonna be the tip of the iceberg, but we wanna start something that hopefully we can continue together. We hope that we can inspire you and inspire other institutions. So, so let's queue up the slides. Terrific. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you, Sharonda, <clears throat> excuse me, for, uh, for uh, projecting the slides uh, and thanks to everyone for joining. I'm very uh, excited to be here with all of you and uh, embarking on this important dialogue and discussion. Uh, as Nicole mentioned, I wanted to share a bit of the facts and figures from our latest Women in the Workplace report uh, to ground us as we dive into the panel discussion with Tracy and Dr. V. Uh, it is gonna be brief. I think we're gonna try to cover some of the headlines in about five minutes. Uh, but do encourage you, of course, to take a look at the larger study, which is available online, 
And um, I'm very happy to, uh, to try to answer as many questions as I can during this conversation. Uh, just as a quick uh, point of context around the study, for those who uh, maybe aren't familiar, Women in the Workplace is a joint research effort uh, between McKinsey and Lean In Org. Uh, we've now uh, just started our 10th year in 2024 of this joint research. And together we've created the largest comprehensive study of the state of women in corporate America, looking both at the talent pipeline of women as well as their experiences across industries. Uh, and Sharonda, if you wouldn't mind just going to the next slide, uh, folks can just get a sense of the number of organizations that we've had a chance to engage with. So since our uh, inception in 2015, we've engaged with over 800 organizations and this past year uh, with about 270 organizations. So the insights I'm going to share are, again, across what we have learned from these organizations uh, and, again, cross industries. You can see in the full report, I think the link is just being shared, some of the uh, details by sector. So, so diving in, in terms of some of the key trends, if we could please go to the next page. This is a snapshot of the talent pipeline of women. Uh, we've included, of course, men uh, as well uh, on this uh, pipeline review, and we've broken out uh, at a high level uh, white women and women of color, as well as white men and men of color. So you can get a sense of the overall pipeline. Uh, a few things that I would flag. So uh, the first is that we have seen some positive movement and momentum uh, in terms of representation of women overall over the last few years, particularly at the C-suite. Uh, the more sobering news, so I'm going to be doing some bright spots and then some sobering news. So, you know, the sobering news is that those gains are quite fragile. And so what we've seen in the last few years through the great breakup is that many senior women are uh, leaving the workforce, uh, particularly those who are next in line for the C-suite and they're leaving due to burnout because they were doing exactly what organizations wanted them to do over the last few years. They were stepping up as people leaders. They were sponsoring and supporting uh, women and people of color. They were leading DEI efforts. They were showing up for their teams and employees throughout the, you know, the pandemic and all of the, uh, you know, different new ways that folks needed support. Um, but they were getting burnt out and not being recognized uh, in the way that uh, was commensurate with how much organizations were valuing uh, what they were doing. So that's one one flag. The second is uh, there is fragility at the beginning of the pipeline. So as you'll see here on the slide, entry level overall is nearly at parity. So 40, um, you know, 40 odd percent uh, representation, uh, close to 50 percent of women at the top. I'm sorry, at the, at the start of the funnel. And then we see a large drop in the representation of women when we move from that entry level to the manager level role. And we call that the broken rung. Um, so this, it, this becomes uh, an almost insurmountable hurdle as we think about the advancement of women. And uh, if we think about the experience of women of color, each of these areas of fragility is even more pronounced and negative. So as an example, for every 100 men who are promoted at the entry level to manager level, um, it, 83 of those, uh, um, uh, excuse me, for every 100 men, 83 women are promoted. And if we look at the representation of women of color, only 78 women of color are promoted for every 100 men. And if we look at the experience of Black women, it's even lower. And so uh, as we look at the talent pipeline, again, some things to celebrate, some pockets of good, uh, but things are fragile. And it is uh, you know, a, a similar but worse uh, experience for women of color and uh, Black women in particular. One, one or two other things I wanted to highlight for the group before we dive into the panel is that we did look at also a number of myths uh, in this year's study. Now, some of these myths are not new news, but they weren't repeating because they still exist and have not been fully addressed. One of those myths is around the ambition of women being lower than men and that being a reason why we're seeing women leave the workforce or not being promoted. Our research actually found that that's not the case. Women and men uh, equally want to be promoted about eight out of 10 times to their next role. And that number has actually increased over the last five years. Uh, we've actually, when we look at, um, at the uh, promotion desire for women of color and Black women, it's even higher. 87% of Black women want to be promoted to the next uh, level role. So that is not uh, that is not what's what the data is showing us, that it's not that women are less ambitious. They are equally, if not more ambitious. 
And the flexibility that we've had in terms of choice around where and how to work over the last few years has been a huge um, enabler of that uh, ambition, with one out of five women citing that the ability to have the flexibility in where they work uh, enabling them to stay in the workforce or reduce the number of hours uh, or not have to reduce the number of hours that they worked. The second myth that uh, often comes up is that it's the glass ceiling right at the top of the of the pipeline that is the biggest challenge for women. We just looked at the talent pipeline, and as we discussed uh, just now, the real issue is, again, at that broken rung where women are being disproportionately uh, promoted at a lower rate than men, and again, particularly lower for women of color and Black women. I'm going to jump to the fourth point on the page uh, first. Uh, this is around flexible work. Again, another myth being that women want flexibility more than men or that they benefit from it more than men. And again, what we saw on our research is that that's not the case. Both men and women cited the flexibility of where to work and having choice uh, in deciding that um, that structure as one of their top three benefits, uh, with healthcare being the top benefit. So again, both men and women value uh, the ability to be choiceful around where they work, to have the option to work remotely. We saw that that was the case for women across the pipeline at every role. The desire for that flexibility um, and including going, uh, you know, going on site into the office was also something that we saw women, uh, women celebrate across different archetypes. So that included child giver, caregivers, um, you know, those who have other household responsibility. So uh, again, flexibility is something that both men and women value. Now, what we also know is that within that flexibility, uh, particularly when it comes to re working remotely, women are benefited by that because they face fewer microaggressions when they're working remotely. But the flip side is uh, when they go into the office, they are not only facing more microaggressions, but they're also benefiting less than men uh, in those in-person office mo moments. Men are often getting more direct feedback and leadership exposure, which we know are critical for success. The last, um, the last uh, myth I wanna briefly touch on is around microaggressions. Despite the name being micro, the impact is quite macro. So again, microaggressions being uh, either challenges to competence or demeaning and othering comments. As you see here on this heat map, we looked at women with different marginalized identities and saw that a number of archetypes of women uh, face microaggressions more than others. And in particular, if you see for Black women, they face more of those othering uh, and demeaning comments. And as a result, uh, when women are facing these microaggressions, they are self-shielding more. That means that they are not bringing their full selves into the workforce. They are not speaking up with their incredible ideas and innovation. Um, they are not able to fully contribute. And that's not what we, uh, any of us want, right, in terms of coming to the right uh, and most innovative solutions in our, in our work. So I've shared a lot of the, um, again, a few bright spots in there, but a lot of the sobering uh, statistics. The good news is that there are a number of things that both organizations and individuals can do. Of course, we're going to talk even more about this with Tracy and Dr. V in the panel, but just to whet folks' appetites. Um, you see here on the page five key uh, priorities that best-in-class organizations are leaning into as they think about how to address and remedy um, these pipeline and experience challenges. The first two around addressing the broken rung and also fine tuning flexible work. At the heart of both of those is really data. So what we do know is that not every organization, actually less than 50% are currently capturing data that allow them to track their pipeline at a granular level and also track the different outcomes uh, or rather the outcomes of different styles of work. And so having that kind of data will uh, both capturing it and analyzing it further will allow organizations to better track what's working and what isn't working, whether that be, hey, where are there pockets of positive pipeline movement for women in our organization and what, what can we learn from that and move to other parts of business? Or, you know, how can we also remedy this myth that somehow working flexibly is uh, less productive, right, or, or not leading to the same outcomes by tracking uh, not only the way people are working, but also things like promotion rates and performance reviews and things like that. Another key area here is really around organizations continuing to support people managers. We know day-to-day -day managers shape the bulk of our experiences, and they have been asked to do even more new types of things in the last few years. So they require additional training. They require structural support to remove bias um, so that they can also continue to show up and, uh, and support their talent, uh, particularly women and, and folks of color, in, in new, more curated ways. 
And then last but not least, if we look at the next page, which lists out the things that each of us can do, that's the good news that we can all do things starting later today. Uh, the one that I wanted to highlight most on this page is around giving women direct feedback. Uh, we know that women receive more ambiguous and less direct feedback, and that is uh, a barrier in terms of being able to then uh, work on and demonstrate the areas that they need to to be even more successful. Um, and so that is one of, as you see on the page, several things that each of us can be uh, doing and encouraging others to do more. I've talked at you quite a bit. I uh, I want to make sure we um, we get to you know hear again from Tracy and Dr. V on this important conversation. But uh, just we'll check in with Nicole and Sharonda to see if there are any burning questions in the chat that would be helpful to answer or address at this time. First of all, that's great. Uh, I love that you do this report. Um, and I'm zeroing in on two things, Encore, uh, broken rung and then microaggressions that are absolutely associated with racism and those things are crushing people. So I wanna highlight that. I also wanna acknowledge the fact that your survey is a, is a survey of uh, individuals who work in corporate America. But I, I also wanna add the fact that this is happening in nonprofit, this yes. is happening in academia, this is happening in foundations. And over the last six months, there have been a slew of reports. I'm gonna highlight two, the Washington Women's Foundation report and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government report. And those things affirm, uh, and, and in some respects get more, more granular. And, and I would say, read the full McKinsey report because there are some quotes and some pullouts from black women uh, you know, that shake the body of my foundation. So with that, I wanna turn to uh, Dr. V and Tracy and basically get your reaction to the report, what resonates and then what additional context and stories or, or other data that you wanna lift up that sort of affirms um, and, and quite frankly, you know, amplifies what you've seen, already heard here. Yes, I, uh, Dr. V, do you want me to jump in here and maybe you bring up the rear or? Okay, okay, Sounds I good. think Thank that's you. it. All right. Thank you so much. Well, I, you know, I really, I really want to, to thank you so much, Ankur, for, um, the work that you're leading at McKinsey and just, um, to commend McKinsey for the work that it's doing as well as as um, other um, organizations that are doing longitudinal studies that kind of move the conversation beyond anecdote. Because I think right now, uh, the isolated stories aren't helping. What we really need is this longitudinal data that confirms for many of us that what we may be experiencing, what we may be seeing, um, that might be very personal or geo-specific if we're in a particular um, area of, of the country, um, is. is not isolated. And so one thing I want to lift up um, to your point, Nicole, and again, I, I, I commend YWCA um, for the work that it's doing nationally, but particularly Metropolitan Chicago under your leadership. So I, I have to say that. Uh, but I do think there is a quote that really spoke to me, and it is, and is this one that when white women experience challenge, and this is in the course of the workplace, Black women face a tsunami. And that uh, stands out for me. And as, uh, as the fact that uh, one in three Black women, despite the fact, the, the fact that Black women are on pace um, to becoming some of the most well-educated and degree-holding uh, women in the workplace, um, if we continue to see the kind of um, upward trajectory in terms of degree attainment, as well as, you know, many reports from Forbes and others that describe um, Black women's willingness to take on very challenging positions, we still see um, Black women leaders saying, at least one in three saying that they've been passed over um, for 
for promotional opportunities despite um, seeking um, them out and, and being denied on the basis of personal characteristics, including um, stating that uh, race and gender um, you know, are, are not considered to be assets. But another thing that I wanted to just talk about uh, quickly is particularly the hiring of Black leaders and, and Black women in particular post-George Floyd in that uh, era of um, what we called racial uh, reckoning. In, in which um, we saw black women facing the glass cliff. And this is a term that actually was uh, coined by uh, Ryan and, and Haslam in 2005. And the glass cliff refers to the tendency um, to hire women and especially women of color at times of real crisis in an organization. So the fact that we also have um, longitudinal data that says that uh, that black people, black managers in in general, face higher staff turnover uh, because less white workers want to work specifically for for black leaders, even though white workers tend to enjoy greater promotion and greater job retention under black managers more so than than other managers. We still see black women leaders being hired at these critical times um, in the lifespan of an organization, but also facing higher staff turnover, uh, less degree of of, of trust and less support from funders and even from their boards. So I want to stop there because I think that while we are seeing that we have a group of women who are prepared uh, to serve um, and willing to serve in high stress, uh, very visible positions, they are either being passed over or if they get into those positions, they are not being uh, set up for success. So I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Dr. V. Thanks, Tr Tracy, and I echo all of your remarks, particularly thanking uh, Nicole and Ankur for this dialogue today. What really resonated with me, there were so many points, I mean, I could probably go on and on about all of the, the various different nuances that resonate with me with the report, but I'm particularly grateful for the practical guidance that it offers, the recommendations uh, such as fixing the wrong for women of color with a special focus on, uh, or excuse me, for women with a special focus on women of color. Um, microaggressions, you know, to your point, uh, Nicole and Anakor, there is nothing micro about microaggressions. The cumulative effect of microaggressions over time actually can sicken our body, mind, body, and spirit. And so if we're spending the majority of our time in the workplace and we're being exposed to this high level of stress, trauma, racism, sexism, and a variety of other isms, there is really no way we can leave that at the front door, that we don't carry that you know, in our homes and how that impacts our social relationships, our family relationships. I mean, it ex extends so much further beyond just you know, eight, 10, 12 hours you know, in a work day. So um, I wanted to highlight that. Also, the way that the report busts myths, I think is really important to depict an accurate and genuine narrative, as opposed to just relying on tropes and stereotypes. So I really appreciate um, the, the uh, report for that. And then lastly, the role of mentorship this is so key because how do we develop our, our future generations of Black women leaders? It starts with Black young girls, right? The work of the YWCA very clearly to support and uplift um, all women and girls, but particularly for our conversation today, looking at Black women and girls. So, you know, once you have achieved a certain level of success, not to just rest on your laurels, but to reach back around you, look to see who could use the sort of leadership support who would benefit from just listening to your stories or being able to brainstorm something that's going on with them in the workplace that perhaps you've had some experience and that wisdom you can share with others. So the importance of highlighting uh, mentorship is really key as well. And I think that um, mentorship overall is, is a phenomenal opportunity, but when you have an opportunity to actually be paired with a mentor that has 
a similar uh, background or, or uh, social identity, it's even that much more powerful. And I think it's really crucial when we're looking at intersectional identities. So another aspect of the report that you know I'm, I'm very grateful for really uplifting is not just looking at um, you know, race and ethnicity, but looking at LGBTQI status, um, disability status, and a variety of other intersectional identities that impact us as as a work in the workplace. Because you may go into the workplace, you know, as an African American woman, but if you are uh, Afro Latina, queer, and have a a, a disability, um, all of those groups I identify with, um, you know, that that even adds more challenge and potential stress to the mix. So um, those are the, the I guess, the fine points that I would like to highlight out of the report. Uh, all, you're, you both are on fire already. <laughs> you, you, you came out blazing. So I, I do wanna pick up on one thread that uh, Tracy mentioned. Uh, she talked about the, the wave of black women leaders uh, who ascended to leadership, nonprofit, government, uh, corporate, but this was not, this was unique because we, they navigated pandemics, they navigated political polarization that's unprecedented. It's never been this way. This is very unique. Uh, economic deep inequity, uh, an emotional pandemic, we're all hanging on a string. And then the real time renegotiation of the employee employer contract. The number of colleagues that are navigating strikes and unionization, which are all good things, but just imagine the weight of managing all of that right now. Does anyone want to just comment on why we were ready to do this, though? I realize there's some struggle, but there are some leadership qualities that Black women uniquely bring to leadership that make us phenomenal leaders. So can we just touch on that a little bit. I'll start on that. Um, I, I think as Black women, we bring a historical context of perseverance, of resilience, of the ability to, to overcome because we've had to. We also bring a, a communal sense in terms of, uh, again, this the importance of of not just being in it for our individual selves, but a communal a communal identity, being in it for community as well. That community is an, an important part of I, our identity, and I think that translates in every possible leadership sphere. The importance of thinking about others, your team, your organization, your consumers, clients, patients, you know, consumer, whatever your stakeholder group is called. You know, again, that ability to relate as members of a shared community, I think, is a is a really unique unique asset that we as um, African-American or Afro-Latina women bring uh, to the workplace. Uh, perfection. Tracy, any builds on that? Yeah. I feel I like mean, we're I think... creative geniuses. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I also think, you know, again, what is so important about, you know, having this conversation today is that, you know, we're able to, to talk about this um, in a way that is data informed as opposed, yes, I mean, there is so much genius, right? Um, amongst black women leaders in the leadership, um, you know, pipeline and pool, you know, a lot that, you know, isn't nurtured, but when we, so I want to say one thing because I am a librarian. So I have to say this part in preparation for uh, this panel, when I was doing a lot of research and just trying to underscore um, the conversation we would have today with data, I kept looking for, you know, Black women leaders and, and leadership amongst uh, African-American women, all of those things. And one of the things that I found that was really interesting is, um, is the, the, what would come up as anchor text, meaning that people are looking for this again and again, is why are Black women so confident? Why are Black women, you know, what is the source of Black women's confidence in, in, in the workplace? And one of the, and so while I think Black women's leadership and confidence, um, you know, being sort of uh, uh, coordinated in that way um, is, is wonderful, it also speaks to the ways in which um, sometimes um, the, the kind of survival techniques that Black women have had to have just in America sometimes show up in the workplace as confident overconfidence or even arrogance and so one but one thing going to what I think the 
assets are is that there's a, a interesting study um, from 2018, so about uh, six years ago now, called Beating the Odds, Leadership Lessons from Senior African American Women. And it was uh, 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 written by uh, Robert, Mayo, Robin, Eli, and Thomas. And one of the things that they identified were three core skills when they looked at uh, African American women leaders who were vastly, as we've heard, underrepresented. Um, in, uh, in senior leadership across all of those sectors that you've named. And the three skills that they found to be common amongst executive leaders were emotional intelligence, authenticity, and agility. All of the things that are necessary and have been necessary for this liminal space, right, that we've been in uh, since the pandemic, and um, that are really necessary to uh, in some cases, pivoting the organizations um, that we are in and leading um, so that they can be successful and so that the work can be sustainable and impactful. But I want to I state those again, because again, this is data. So it isn't just that um, these are things that are nice to have, or maybe some uh, Black women leaders have, but when uh, the longitudinal data um, looking at a corpus of Black women leaders, the three most common skills sets, emotional intelligence, authenticity, meaning also vulnerability, the ability to demonstrate uh, vulnerability even as a leader, and then finally agility. And I think that those are the kinds of skill sets that are going to be necessary um, to make our organizations and our institutions last and relevant. So I'm, I'm so glad that those were named and called out, and I see evidence of that everywhere I look when I look at Black women leadership. Tracy, thank you for bringing the research behind that. Uh, for, for any of the sort of human resources professionals on the on the phone, people who are uh, unleashing the potential in people every day, those are Lominger competencies that corporations use all the time to identify research. So, so to see that that it's, it's been verified <laughs> uh, that that we bring that to leadership uh, is outstanding. So, you know, today is interesting. We didn't know this was going to happen today. But today, in Crane Chicago Business, there was an article published uh, with the headline, How DEI Went From Feel-Good Buzzword to Radioactive Flashpoint in Chicago C-Suites. Now, I must admit, the, 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 the headline is flashy. Uh, and it's conveying more than is actually in the article, I would contain. But I, with that article hitting today, the conversation we're having today, I would love to hear from the panelists. And, and Encore, I'm going to start with you on this one, because McKinsey's a global consulting firm. Uh, you're working with, you know, governments, corporations around the world. So you see it play out in different ways. W what are people saying? What, what are you seeing amidst this larger public narrative around the DEI backlash. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fascinating time, uh, as you mentioned. And um, uh, I would say a few things, and I'm, uh, I was gonna say eager for folks' thoughts also in the chat, I'm reading it eagerly as well. So so wanna make sure we bring bring those voices in. Um, I am very encouraged by what uh, what I'm personally seeing. So as, as mentioned, uh, you know, in my intro by by you, Nicole, one of the one of the endeavors that I lead with lead within the firm is what we call Connected Leaders Academy, where we have a series of leadership programs that provide early career manager and executive level leaders the opportunity to come together and um, and learn and build community and accelerate their trajectories. And we bring a specific context where we have pro you know programming and discussions which uh, may be you know most relevant for those who are black or who identifies Black, Hispanic, Latino, uh, and Asian. And um, this is something that we launched just a few years ago. And what, what, what I'm encouraged by is the fact that we're seeing uh, so many organizations, private and public sector, across industry, um, really uh, lean in to, not only through our program, but you know, like, certainly through our program, uh, continue to support their talent. And not only by engaging with them in our programming, as an example, to date, we've had over 76,000 participants and 1,000 organizations participate. Um, there's certainly this piece around 
enabling folks to create community and 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 have a space where they have belonging and and can sort of speak openly. But I'm also encouraged because I'm seeing organizations invest in the critical leadership that is needed to surround talent. So we know, as an example, women are often uh, over mentored but under sponsored, and we know sponsorship, which is effectively advocacy. Uh, is an area where certainly women and women of color are often um, left behind because those in senior positions don't always look like us. Um, and it's very human nature to lean in to support or seek out somebody with whom you share an element of identity. And so what we're seeing is organizations really lean in to uh, be more structured, remove bias, right, in terms of creating sponsorship and uh, and other opportunities around their talent that are going through programs like ours or just in general. So I think, you know, what I'm seeing is very encouraging in terms of, and I know there's a lot of research out there. We can certainly share some in the chat of some of the surveys and, and research I know I've read, I'm sure Dr. V and Tracy and Nicole, you have others, but we're also seeing CEOs and other leaders really maintain that, you know, investing in their talent, DEI, it remains a priority. And so, um, you know, that's just one snippet of what I, what I see day to day and what I'm very, very encouraged by. Perfect. If I could just build on that, um, I see a comment by Jessica Horton in the chat that I, I really wanted to uh, uplift here, talking about using ESG and ERG as opposed to um, EDI and DEI. And as fate would have it, um, I'm actually in law school now, uh, a master's of jurisprudence program, and I'm taking a um, ESG class right now. So I was really excited to see her comment in the chat. And also um, in, in reading about this, she's absolutely correct. Um, organizations are, are really finding stealthy workarounds. Organizations that still want to be committed to, to the DEI, um, EDI space are finding stealthy workarounds. One of them is looking at how it's embedded in, um, ESG, talking about environmental, uh, social, and governance. Um, so really looking at it from the corporate lens that this is a an embedded part of ESG strategies. So it's not going anywhere, but organizations may or may not feel comfortable calling it out as DEI, but are calling it something else, but still doing the work. So for me, you know, I... I don't mind as much what you're calling it as long as the work is still being done, the work is still taking place, and the people that need to benefit from it are benefiting from it. I think that's the most important aspect here, but the ESG space is really, really uh, very interesting in how it's it's weaving in um, DEI into corporate strategies. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, I'm going to pivot maybe to one other question, and I know there's some questions from the audience. So we're, we're going to uh, loop some of those in. Uh, how do we go from surviving to thriving? Because a lot of what I feel like I've, I've heard each of you say um, is we're navigating. And I got to be honest, I spent 19 years in corporate America before joining uh, the YWCA. And um, I was institutionalized. So, and, and what I mean by that, I was really good at navigating crazy situations. And, and it was almost as if the company, you like, it was like a badge of honor, but in retrospect, I'm like, that was insane. Like, how do we get away from that? And how do we create a workplace that centers black women, that centers people of color more broadly, like, what do we need to do? And I know that, Encore, you teed up something in the McKinsey thing in your report, but I wonder, Tracy, Dr. V, are there other things? I feel like we need to double down because uh, we're not there yet. We're far from where we need to be. Yes, uh, definitely and agreed, right? And I, I'm here to say, you know, Nicole, I've worked across every sector, right? I've worked in education. I've worked in, uh, you know, Fortune 500. I've worked government, um, you know, education, nonprofit, philanthropy, you name it. I've, I've worked in the sectors and I have to say that they're not considerably different, right? I, I, I think that they are, there is a level of, um, 
of gender and race bias that pervades the American workplace period. Um, and, and so I wish I could say that there was one sector that felt or even felt like it was more utopic than, than another, but they, there really hasn't been in my experience. But I, I, I want to say that I think what, what, I, what motivates me and what brings me here to this panel and what gives me hope and I think has made me an advocate um, is that I don't believe that we are tapping the full talent pool. And we are facing today in the American workforce and in American society some of the biggest issues we have ever faced at any time. And we can just say climate if we wanted to say that. If we don't get that right, then it makes other conversations null and void. And yet when we think about climate and our reticence to even talk about it or to deal with the science um, around it, we can see even in that conversation and the way that we have been muzzled um, in that conversation, we can see the workings or the failures of 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 of, of racism and how racism and capitalism really undo each other because we are unable to tap the full talent pool or to have a, a conversation, um, you know, even about human sustainability. But we still have people, and I think Black women um, and, and other people of color, um, LGBTQIA communities, communities that have, you know, been, you know, you know, on the margins that have been marginalized, still fighting uh, for um, for our society. For and and I think that we need everyone in, in the talent pool. The there's an article that I refer to often by uh, Frank Dobbins and um, Alexandra Califf uh, called "Why Diversity Programs Fail." And, um, and 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 uh, it was in the Harvard Business Review, and there's longer studies that they have have done, but it's really well sort of summarized in the Harvard Business Review. And what they say is that we actually need to hire more people of color in management positions, and we need to hire more women of color, more Black women in management positions. So, you know, how do we do that? I think for one thing is that we have to insist. I, I do believe that Black for Black women in particular. I think we have to stop working um, in systems that uh, that sicken us, that deny us, that um, uh, that you know are in terms of macro aggressions. Um, that deny our talent, we have to confront those systems. And even though it seems hard, if we do it in mass, I said, and this might be a little bit controversial, but I said, what if we had a day of absence of all Black women in the workforce? We would bring the workforce, the American workforce, to its knees. And how I know is because I spend a little bit of time in Montgomery, Alabama, and I have seen what women did to a bus system and even to uh, the financial ecosystem in, in a city. But I'm an activist, right? So when I say that, I know that that's the way that I think. But I do think that we have to fight for conditions in which Black women, who I believe are often um, the canary in the coal mine, and when I say that, just for that reference, I mean um, the old practice in coal mines of bringing a canary inside to make sure that the working conditions were safe for minors. And I think in a lot of ways, what we see by the attrition rates of Black women in leadership, we and I think Dr. V has talked about this a little bit, is also to the rates of sickness and illness of Black women leaders that we are beginning to document. Um, it is not a culture of wellness. In order for us to have a community and a space in which we can thrive, we actually need more Black women um, in leadership, and we also need to deal with what's happening with the glass cliffs that Black women are facing. I'd love to jump in maybe and uh, just build on a few things Tracy mentioned, if I could. I just took some notes here because there's so much richness, Tracy, in what you just shared and so many, uh, you know, sort of um, connecting thoughts. I mean, I, I just wanted to maybe underscore this piece, just what's come up in this conversation, right? There's There's actually a wealth of data and information Right. Um, I think every one of us has been sharing and Tracy, you just, you know, shared more right around some of the articles, the research that clearly speak to, um, for lack of a better way to put it, the business case. Right. The business impact of hiring, retaining, uh, you know, supporting, advancing um, uh, uh, folks of color. And I think sometimes what I observe is uh, that that well, those facts base aren't shared widely. So those of us sort of in the know, having these conversations, right? A bit of a self-selecting group 
um, we have it at our fingertips and are sharing it. Um, and so one powerful thing that, again, I think that's part of the solution set, right? There's not like a one, one thing, right? If only is to really amplify that data and put it in the hands, quite frankly, of again, hiring managers, people managers, right? Say, here's what your, your teams, your business unit, your functional areas, your pocket of the organization looks like. And, you know, here's what your hiring is look like. Uh, because oftentimes, you know, folks are so focused on what they're doing day to day, they're not actually stepping out to look at the big picture and seeing how the hiring process, the choices, the who got promoted, the who didn't, right? How it actually affects the system. So there's something very powerful around having the, those data nuggets be something that are um, shared beyond, right, um, beyond those of us who are, who are uh, you know, storing them and bookmarking them and reading them religiously. I think the second piece is around intention and action. There's often a disconnect. Um, so I just think about, again, looking at our women in the workplace research two years ago, uh, you know, there was a data point around, you know, how many uh, employees would consider themselves ally and over allies, right? And over two thirds of the people surveyed said, I consider myself an active ally, uh, right? I'm doing things on the regular, but the things that they were doing were not actually lining up with what women and women of color needed. And so again, this is again, where that education, the what does it actually mean to, you know, Dr. V, as you were saying, interject in a moment of microaggression, right? Um, and candidly, what we've also seen, right? It's not usually calling out, but calling in people in those moments. Um, otherwise, it's very easy to get you know, shut down or defensive. Um, so again, I think there's, you know, um, you know, much in there, of course, right, about what that could entail. But ultimately, it starts with, you know, cultures and communities and, and managers and people and teams who are willing to have those difficult conversations, call it in the moment and have a conversation and make it a safe zone so that folks don't feel like they're going to get penalized, right, if they say the wrong thing unintentionally, but it's actually going to be a moment to teach and to learn and to do better. Again, easier said than done. But I think these are some of the right cultural elements to what you were saying, Tracy. And, and the last thing I'll just highlight is, like you said, the recruitment, the hiring, the um, bringing in uh, more Black women in particular right into the workforce. We've seen over the last few years incredible focus on hiring for more diverse um, entities, you know, whether that be HBCUs or other, you know, pockets of, um, you know, of talent that could mean, you know, with some of the flexible working, looking at, looking at different geographies, you know, retaining and supporting talent, right, as we we're seeing in the pipeline, right, is another big part of what, you know, each of us, right, as individual people, leaders or organizations need to focus on. So how do you create those sponsorship uh, opportunities, you know, those specialized, you know, support um, that, you know, that folks may need to make sure that they're, you know, that they're able to be set up for success. Again, these are some of the things that, you know, we're seeing leading organizations really lean into, um, but it has to be done, last thing I'll say, it's in an authentic way. So, right, it's not a one size fit all. Often we all have more, more to do, right, than not. And so it is an exercise, like you said, of prioritization, of really figuring out where to start and build that momentum and build some, you know, build some impact. Um, uh, because otherwise it can end up being, you know, a lot of spaghetti against the wall. And people say, oh, well, it's not working. It's like, well, because you've, there's, you know, a lot, maybe too many things going on at once that people can't actually focus or don't know where to focus, right? That that incremental energy or time. I, I love that, Ankar. And you have actually teed up something that is a question. So I know people, we have a few more minutes. So I want to dive into some of the questions that are in the chat. But someone asked a great question around, uh, they've heard the point about women being over-mentored and under-sponsored. We kind of glossed over that. And I don't know, I, I can give a personal example, but if someone else wants to, but I I, I mean, a, a mentor can give you great advice. They can give you some coaching, but that sponsor is the person who's in the room. Like when you're not in the room, they're advocating for you, right? They're, they're advocating for a new opportunity, a new position. Um, they make things happen for you in a way. And I've, I've had the, the luxury of having a sponsor, so I definitely know the difference, but does anyone else want to weigh in on that? And if there's any data, because the question is also saying, are the, I've, I've not seen data on that particular point, but I've actually seen it play out inside organizations. Yeah, I'm happy to quickly jump in because I did see that question come up a few times. So I, I don't think that I've seen a, you know, widespread study, right, on, on this point. But like you, Nicole, have seen this in pockets and microcosms. So again, as an example, my day to day, our Connected Leaders Academy programs, we have an executive program. One of the requirements for any organization who is um, sending folks is that their executives need to have a sponsor. 
And I can tell you that a lot of most of the people who are signing up for the program as executives, this is the first time their organization is actually, for many of them, the first time their organization actually is creating some structure around those sponsorship relationships or making sure that the that there's actually clarity, right? If if I think I'm sponsoring someone or someone thinks that they're sponsoring me, you know, do we do we actually have alignment on what we think is happening? Or making sure that the person has the right sponsor, right? Sometimes it's actually you you have on paper a sponsor, but that person is really more of a mentor, right? Or someone who can be a great cheerleader, but isn't structurally um, you know, set up to be able to actually advocate for you in the way that you need. So, uh, you know, I think I, I've certainly seen through our work, right, that there are many of those kind of course corrections happening, um, uh, you know, to to make sure that the sponsorship is actually happening in a way that's going to have the desired impact. Terrific. And I, I have another question, and this might be for Dr. V and then maybe Tracy. Um, and and the, the, the question is, uh, the, the individual would like to hear more views on how the use of models and language can be detrimental or helpful for an inclusive and thriving workplace uh, and discuss the shift to or the combination of a pipeline or a garden model. And then conversations around fit, because I've heard that I, I can, I this person is in my head because I have had cultural fit. I have been in interview processes where people, we're not talking about people's skills. We're talking about how people might feel about someone. So I would love for uh, Dr. V, Tracy, I'll, any of you guys can weigh in on this one. Well, I'd like to start off with your comment about how someone feels about someone else. It's really important for us all to be educated on implicit or unconscious bias, because that really um, determines how we feel about someone um, on a very unconscious level that then can have real life implications in terms of our behaviors, um, who we might offer an opportunity to and who we might withhold an opportunity from, you know, based on implicit bias. So I do think that um, learning about different models and language is really important. Uh, using evidence-based practices, using the, the data to our advantage, you know, is, is really crucial. I also want to focus on the importance of relationality, because as I listen to Encore speak about um, mentorship versus sponsorship, I think the first cr key critical question is, is that relationship, do I really know the other person. I may be making all types of assumptions about what they need in the way of mentorship or what type of sponsorship opportunities I plan to afford this individual without even having a single conversation about what that person wants, needs, what their ambitions are, what their dreams are, and how they can go about uh, fulfilling those dreams. So without having that level of, of dialogue and discourse at the interrelational level, you may be sending someone down a path that they're completely disinterested or um, you know, don't necessarily have uh, all of the, the assets to go down a particular path. They may, there another path may be more far more fortuitous for their interest and for uh their their idealized trajectory. So I think it, it's really key to have those sort of conversations early on in any type of mentorship or sponsorship uh conversation so that you are making appropriate uh matches or fits. Excellent. And I, I want to pivot to another question, and this this may be our, our final question. I think everyone can weigh in on this one. Um, but the question is, how do we show up for each other when we might feel like we lack power ourselves? I know. Do we feel that, yeah. ladies? Do we feel that one? That is the question of the hour, and I'll be I'll be really quick about this, but I do want to go back to this conversation quickly about sponsorship and mentorship, and also to the notion of, of allies, um, because I, you know, use a terminology um, often, you know, the equity, diversity, and inclusion industrial complex, because I think that over time, we've gotten to a place where um, EDI has become, in some cases, um, a, a veil or mask or smokescreen for bad practices um, and that are justified because an organization is saying that they have a commitment. And, and, and a friend of mine, Keith McGee, who is here in the UK, uh, he says often, we don't need allies, we need accountability. And I, I want to just 
you know, say that that's what this conversation calls for. Show me your um, allyship by being accountable. But I think for Black women, I think one thing that it is important for us to do is to recognize the toll uh, that um, the elements of this conversation are having on other Black women and to reach out uh, to Black women, to sponsor Black women. We already know, and there's so much data that I've shared, that um, Black managers, especially Black women, tend to do this by nature um, in terms of promotion and, and also uh, job retention and hiring diverse works, uh, a diverse workforce. But I think specifically understanding that um, what we might be feeling um, in the workplace might be shared. So in, in, in so supporting each other, but also when in times of bad practice, joining together and hold, and calling calling in the organization before any calling out, call in the organization. Um, make sure that we are turning that anecdote um, or those groups of anecdotes into data and let's hold our organizations accountable. And let's also be accountable to each other in terms of wellness. Uh, some of the best practices I know are retreats, um, getting together um, amongst your peer group. And then lastly, coaching, um, therapy as well as professional coaching. So I think um, for Black women, Women who are, you know, at the executive level, making sure that all of those um, options are available uh, for your staff in general, but certainly for other Black women in light of the glass cliff. I'll let Dr. V have the final word on this, but maybe just uh, a few things that um, came to me top of mind as I heard your question, Nicole. One is the, you know, the uh, the airline announcement, right? The if the oxygen mask drops down, put it on yourself before you help, you know, anybody else. And I and I think about that a lot in terms of this work, right? The the need for each each of us, right, and and uh, to uh, and each other to really focus on that personal well being, like you said, Tracy, and the energy management because this this is a marathon, not a sprint. And so, you know, being really aware of and purposeful to not get into that burnout territory and and making sure to prioritize the mental health and the well being and the community building that you that you so eloquently. Uh, highlighted Tracy, I think is something that is is critical in in terms of um in terms of the marathon here. The other thing I'll sort of share is that there is power, as you said, Tracy, in coming together as community. And with the black leaders that I I get the chance to work with, you know, we are pulling them, pulling them together in cohorts based on where they are in their careers as well as their you know self uh, identified um you know lens of being a black leader. And what we see is that they, you know, 100 percent of the the folks who participated in, in our programs um, you know, have shared with us that this this chance to be with each other, to have this safe space where you can talk about some of the challenges, the strengths, the frustrations, the the moments of celebration. Um, you know, it's something that helps them uh, as leaders. It helps them feel like they've got greater belonging, even if they don't feel that way about their organizations um, and or in their organizations. And it actually can can really be beneficial in terms of oftentimes combating that feeling of being the only right in other pockets. So I think there's something, you know, uh, from a data perspective, as I know we've been focused on that, right, that we've seen that really um, speaks to the value of convening as a community um, as well. And speaking of calling in, I wanted to call in a comment earlier in the chat by Valida uh, Simpson talking about, uh, responding actually to you, Nicole, talking about um, really looking at how this insane work culture, that it is cultural, and the importance of setting boundaries and being accountable for those boundaries to ourselves and to our peer groups so that we can optimize our well-being. Because once again, if we are in the workplace, you know, more often than not, we are being exposed to such a high level of, of, of stress um, perhaps even trauma in certain settings. And, you know, what do we do with that? How does our body carry that? There's an entire field of study called epigenetics that's really looking at um, how DNA expresses itself. So it's, it doesn't really change our DNA per se, but it really looks at, you know, how our genes are turning off or on. And this can impact our mental health, our physical health. And so again, in preparation for this conversation today, I was reading quite a few articles. Epigenetics is an, a fascinating field of study. It is not my area of expertise, but I, I know enough to, to just uh, provide you with a snippet. And there was an article by uh, Kolonowski et al. talking about um, stress overload and DNA methylation in African-American women and looking at 
the intergenerational impact of genetic and psychological factors in a blood pressure study. And it really talks about the strong black woman schema or the superwoman schema. So going back to a previous question about, you know, what are some unique uh, attributes that African American leaders bring to the workplace, that same sense of, of confidence and uh, perseverance can also be flipped to be a negative for us if we are feeling like we have to hold everything and everyone at all times, and we're not really, you know, taking care of ourselves or taking care of one another, which is why being in community with leaders that look like us is so important because we can help keep each other uh, accountable. And so even if you have phenomenal well-being benefits in the workplace, if you don't feel like you can actually avail themselves yourselves of them, um, it, it does you no good. So really having um, supervision that stresses the importance of, of self-care and work-life balance and making sure you're taking your PTO and you know all those sorts of things are really crucial. And I want to share um, in closing, um, many of you may have heard um, a uh, paraphrased by uh, Audre Lorde, who was a phenomenal um, African-American queer author, poet, uh, radical feminist. And she talks about um, self-care as being uh, a radical form of, of self-love, but rarely do we hear her full quote. And I think it's important, uh, particularly looking at some of the health challenges that she faced as a two-time, well, as a cancer survivor who, um, again, uh, battled cancer more than one time, at least twice in her lifetime. And the quote that we often hear, but not in its full context says, I had to examine in my dreams, as well as in my immune function test, the devastating effects of overextension. Overextending myself is not stretching myself. I had to accept how difficult it is to monitor the difference. Necessary for me as cutting down on sugar, crucial, physically, psychically, caring for myself is not and indulgence. It is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. So again, looking at this concept of self-care as something that is necessary, that you know we are entitled to, that we benefit from, and the idea that it's not just about you know um, being reduced to you know a spa day or getting your nails done. Which, mind you, I'm not opposed to that. I think those things are wonderful. But self care really needs to be tailored to the individual. Um, and to give you a, a brief example, uh, I mentioned earlier that I started uh, law school. That's, that might not be everybody's jam in terms of self-care, but for me, the level of intellectual stimuli and the ability to constantly be learning and, and honing my craft and adding to my toolbox, I'm just kind of a nerdy geek like that. I've, I always have been. I really love education. Um, so for me, that was kind of an odd form of self-care. But again, for each individual, you have to look at what feeds your body, mind, and soul and really make sure that you are incorporating those aspects. Um, into your daily living, not into a once a week or once a month, you know, trip to the spa, but that you are taking time, many breaks every day throughout your day to really attend to self-care. Spot on, snap. Are we snapping? Are people clapping? Uh, I love Audre Lorde, so I'm so glad that uh, you have both heard. We, we actually do have a few more minutes if the panelists can stay with us. Uh, we, we do have a few questions. Um, and this is this is a, we're, we're here to talk about this. So I want to uh, evoke a question that says, um, "How do you the, the the assumption here the the uh, question says the assumption here is that Black women know how to support Black women. However, how might we call in a Black woman who may be internalizing and or enacting systems of a uh, white supremacist culture?" in upholding those systems. And I think it's a fair question. Uh, we're in America, we all participate in capitalism. So therefore <laughs> we're all in it. So I'm not sure if anyone wants to respond to that. Yes, I mean, first of all, I just wanna thank you so much, um, Dr. V for invoking Audre Lorde, you know, she, was also a librarian and one of the very few black librarians, you know, of her time and still today, um, only 6% of the profession um, of librarians are black. And so when I think about Audre Lorde, it, 
mean something very specific to me in terms of what motivated me to become a librarian. So uh, her invocation means everything to me. Um, I also think that her invocation means everything for this question, because one of the things that Audre Lorde did was she traveled around the world uplifting Black women and queer communities and Black queer communities. Part of it was encouraging um, women to write, to write their stories. And that's so important because we are in an era of unprecedented um, censorship. And some of the first attacks um, and most severe attacks when it comes to censorship have been erasing um, the stories uh, about people of color, stories written by and about um, the queer community, and stories written by and about uh, civil rights activism and civil rights leaders. And so I definitely think that that effort to silence those communities um, is paralleled in, 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 the, uh, in the workforce. So I, I think this conversation and the invocation of Audre Lorde is really important. But I do think we have to, to real, realize that um, we don't need white people um, to have white racism. It is so much of the, it's, it's, it's like we're in fish and that's the water when it comes um, to the workforce. And so I do think that we have to do this kind of call in and I'll give, a, you know, an experience, you know, myself. I remember working in the corporate sector and having someone another black lady who wouldn't speak to me no matter you know even if it was just the two of us and i was raised to speak my family's from louisiana and so if i see you i'm gonna speak even if you know it's just a nod of the head i'm going to acknowledge you but i i remember it just so happened that that person and i actually ended up on an elevator together and that was my opportunity to say you know that there are just a few of us and when you in front of others refuse to acknowledge me or to return, it doesn't hurt my Oh, we got a little signal breakup in London and, and she was right on the verge of saying something profound. <laughs> so so while we, we can't get her back, I'll just pick up really quickly okay. on, on where she left off. Um, I think it's very difficult to call out or even call in people who look like us because there are so few of us at the table that we may have a sense of you know, an internalized uh, guilt about not wanting to call that other person out because not, you know, not wanting to make any of us look bad or, or tear down um, anyone who is, is on the rise. And so I think that we have to sort of interrogate that within ourselves and say, okay, you know, regardless, I mean, you all may have heard the term, you know, not all kinfolk uh, or not all skin folk or kinfolk, you know, the idea that we are not a monolith as a people. And so we may harbor a variety of different types of, of biases based on uh, color, education, class, uh, you know, a variety of intersectional identities in which we are, you know, deploying or perpetuating that, uh, you know, the, the white racist infrastructure that we were born into. And so really the ability to, um, again, interrogate what's going on with us, like, are we being overly protective of this person because she looks like us, but she's actually being, you know, toxic in the workplace. Um, and so what do we what do we do in that space? Um, certainly, if you have, uh, and I'm not, and I'm not calling out, you know, gossip, but more so if you have a support system within the workplace, trusted others that you know, will have your back and maybe just kind of asking, you know, it, have you had this experience or have does this resonate with you at all so that you can do that that self check in terms of what may be you know an individual interpersonal situation and what might be more prevalent uh, in the workplace that's being experienced by others and i've actually had that uh, experience uh, in the workplace and it was part of the reason why um, i i left a specific uh, position and during my exit interview it was like the, the floodgates were open and I learned that this person was problematic to so many people, um, regardless of, of racial or ethnic background, that she was just kind of a, a problematic, uh, toxic individual, but that people didn't really want to confront that because they were concerned that if they confronted it, they might be accused of sexism, racism, or some other sort of ism for calling out bad behavior in the workplace. So I don't know that that really gives an answer to the question. It, it's very difficult, but um, again, really looking at 
your your own interactions, investing in trusted others, and then you know if all else fails, um, HR should have mechanisms you know to to help deal with these types of situations. Thank you so much, Dr. V. Welcome back, Tracy. Did you want to finish your your loop your thought? Excuse the buffering on my end, everyone. Um, I will just sum it up to say I do think that we need to call um, in members of our own community. You know, one thing is that, you know, the crabs in a bucket, you know, type of mentality where people may see where another person of color might see someone else in their same peer group um, or from their same race or ethnic group as competition or there might be only, you know, room for one of us is what keeps the pie small. Right. Um, we we know that uh, the more of anything um, that is created, the greater the opportunity for an ecosystem. And what I was saying is that even though it took a lot, you know, to call that person in, once I got them on the elevator in the safety of a private space, I felt like I could just share my heart. And and also the values that I was raised with, you know, my in in terms of acknowledging others. And so um, I think by the end of it, what I was saying is that even if it was performative, uh, whenever the person saw me, they definitely spoke. And I was joking to say they almost hugged me each time because I think, frankly, that they hadn't expected um, that I would call them in. And I think that it is really important because we cannot participate in the propagation of this bias that hurts us, that hurts our communities, but frankly, that hurts the American workforce. As I said, we are not tapping the full ta uh, talent pool and we have some real Im important issues to address um, just systemically. And if we are, if we are participating um, in those systems of bias, we also need to call each other in. I love that, Tracy. Uh, on a related note, that's that's perfect because uh, we've talked about executives at the top, but we realize that at corporations, uh, at nonprofits and foundations, uh, you have boards of directors, uh, people who play a role, shareholders and companies that play a role in supporting Black women's leadership. Uh, how do we, what kind of accountability do we expect at that level? What does that look like? I'm, I'm going to jump. Oh, no, go, no, please yeah, go for yeah. it. Yeah, why don't you go? Well, let, let me just say this. This is one thing that I think a lot about, um, and I was talking about this with someone else. You know, we're at the point where about greater than 70% of our K through 12 workforce um, is now white and mostly white women. So we are facing um, a situation in which most people in the professional sector have not even been taught by a, a person of color, let alone a black person. So right away, there's already bias against our intellectual acumen, um, our authority, our ability to be leaders, because people haven't seen it. And the reason why I problematize that is because if you don't expect a particular leader to be smart, or, or to be legitimate as a leader, you're going to see some problems. And frankly, I do think we need to, to really tackle and re-diversify our K-12 through workforce because it wasn't always like that. But I do think that that's a problem because especially when you get to the sort of board level where, you know, really you have uh, the executive director or executive leadership that is responsible for um, the operations and then you have a board that's more responsible for, say, um, the strategy or or just minding impact um, at the sustainability of an organization. When those lines between to blur, blur and cross, um, sometimes you might see boards that actually become a deterrent um, for an executive director. And certainly you can see it the other way, but usually by virtue of numbers alone, you know, the board is going to outweigh an executive leader or executive director. But I see that relationship complicated because of race and gender. I've seen cultures of mediocrity that have been allowed to persist for 10, 20, 30 years without, you know, so much as a slap on the hand. And then I've seen cultures where Black women um, and other leaders of color have led innovation or organizational change only to see uh, the board rising up against the leader. So I do think, though, that, um, again, the issue of who is a legitimate leader, who is seen as innovative, who is seen as having intellectual acumen, all of those things become complicated, and they've been complicated because of race and gender. 
I was going to say, I'm, I'm maybe taking a little bit of a different lens. Um, I'm, I'm so inspired hearing Tracy and Dr. V. I could listen, I could listen for, for all days. I'm sure we all could. I'm seeing amazing comments in the chat. Maybe just broadening the, the discussion a bit in terms of, um, you know, it starts at the top, right? I think, right? We all know. And so it's, it's leaders, uh, whether that be CEOs, presidents, boards, you, you know, uh, who, who really not just uh, talk the talk, but walk the walk sets the tone for the whole organization, you know, to your point, Tracy, and if there's disconnect, right, that, that, that creates friction. I think this is where, um, and again, I'm sort of coming back to this piece around data, right? The data can be quite powerful. Um, one other data source, which I'm happy to share um, as part of the follow-up, it's, it's, a, it's a body of research that we, we've conducted over the last uh, decade plus called Diversity Matters. It clearly shows that uh, organizations who have senior executive teams that are uh, diverse, whether that by, be by gender and or race and ethnicity, outperform their, you know, th their peers who, who who have less diversity. And, and the difference between, you know, I hate to say it, the winners and the losers, right, is only increasing. And so having, you know, that level of, uh, you know, sharing out to your point, Tracy, around the data and the facts, I think can be an incredibly powerful place to start if there isn't alignment or just understanding, uh, right, um, uh, you know, at the at the very top or in, in some, you know, across those those folks. Um, I, I will say, I think also this is where often we can see boards being a real enabler. So I was actually with a group um, two weeks ago. It was a group of senior women uh, in private equity. And one of them was sharing anecdotally about how it was their investors who called the boards and said, unless you actually bring the diversity that you know represents our portfolio companies and the talent that, you know, we have in our various industries and sectors We're you know, if you don't do that, we're going to pull our funds, right? So I've also seen, right, the boards being a real enabler of saying, you know, if this isn't addressed, if, if you're not actually solving for bringing in those different voices and perspectives and leaders and archetypes, um, then we're going to, we're going to take our, you know, take our funds elsewhere as well. So, so I think, I think there's definitely instances also where the board can, can really be the instigator, right? Or that, you know, that catalyst, um, you know, at the top as well. And I believe that representation is important. Tracy referenced it in the K through 12. Um, my sector is healthcare, and certainly we are underrepresented in, in healthcare, particularly um, in, in physicians and, and other higher levels of, of clinicians and, and hospital administrators. And this lack of diversity actually can have a negative, a deleterious impact you know, on your health if you're unlikely to seek help because you've had negative experiences uh, in healthcare, um, you know, due to, to uh, you know, the ways that healthcare historically in the past has traumatized bodies of color. And part of this is also unearthing silenced uh, narratives or narratives that have been ignored. So I, I hesitate to even defer to him as doctor because his practices were quite barbaric. But uh, Dr. Uh, J. Marion Simmons, or Sims rather, who's largely uh, really considered the father of modern gynecology, at least in the US. Um, but do people know that how he actually achieved that so called accolade was through uh, basically experimenting on Black bodies, the Black bodies of enslaved women? And this is someone that we're holding up as a, as a beacon in, in medical science. And when we look at, and there's a, an excellent book uh, by Harriet Washington, who was a journalist uh, uh, called uh, Medical Apartheid, and I'm forgetting the subtitle, but it's an excellent uh, book that really looks at the history of medical and scientific ex uh, exploitation and experimentation on black bodies and bodies of color um, in the United States. So the vestiges that we see of uh, Dr. And again, I use that term very <laughs> loosely, Sims, is that today, you know, modern clinicians may still be harboring um, beliefs that are not correct based on the, the research of the past. So ideas that um, Black bodies don't experience pain the same way that other bodies do and therefore may not require the same type of uh, medical intervention or palliative care. Um, also, the belief that African Americans um, may not be as medically compliant as others, and those are largely due to social determinants of health, not having access to, to uh, quality health care or insurance or uh, 
uh, healthy foods in, in your community. So all of these sort of larger social and structural determinants of health are really impacting our healthcare system today and the belief systems of our, our modern day clinicians. So it's really important to diversify the healthcare workforce, to have that level of representation, and again, also to unearth those, those silence uh, narratives so that we can really get a better understanding of how and why we are where we are today so that we can begin to dismantle um, those negative structures that are impacting our health on a daily basis. Thank you again, Dr. V, for, for lifting that up. Uh, thank you, all the panelists, Tracy, Encore, uh, thank you to the YWCA team. There was so much richness in this conversation uh, and data back data backed everything up today. This is not antidotes. These are this is data uh, that we presented today. And we actually had someone ask a question about how do we get the data out here? That's exactly why we had the webinar today, because it's under the radar, all of these reports. Uh, and unless we're all uh, data geeks like Dr. V and Tracy, we might miss it. Uh, so we want to raise awareness for the data that's out there. What I also heard, I, I heard that, you know, Black women have skill sets. Tracy went through the competencies that we bring to leadership that are unique um, and that help us thrive. And we want Black women to continue to thrive and double downing on DEI, changing and supporting these institutions in that journey is the key for all employees to thrive. It's, it's just essential. So thank you again for helping us understand this. I know, again, it's just the tip of the iceberg for the conversation. We look